right, good morning. Come on in. Well, hey, if you're in here and you're ready, why don't you open up to Psalm 107 for me as we get started this morning. We're going to spend some time there. If you're out in the foyer, lobby area, go ahead and make your way in. Well, hey, I just want to start this morning focusing on the love of God. We're going to dwell on that this morning. Our hope and prayer is that it is rich and full and life-changing for you as you think about the way that our Heavenly Father loves us. And it's an easy doctrine to think about sometimes, but it's also can be a difficult thing because we like to put our performance in there and think that our performance affects that sometimes, like there's earning or there's favor based on how well I obeyed him or whatever that may be. But we have a God this morning, if you're with me this morning, we have a God who exemplified his love for us and that while we were still sinners, amen, while we were still sinners, he died for us. And so if I could just put a seed of uh, Psalm 107 in your brain now and then we'll, we'll revisit it a little bit later in the set. It just says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. You can see on the screen right there in verses 13 and 14, this verse or this chapter is all about these people who were wayward and wandering and lost. And it keeps bringing back this theme. Yet they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them. We can have that same testimony this morning. Yet we cried out to the Lord and he saved us. He brought them out of the darkness, utter darkness and brokenness. And he broke away their chains. That's the God who we come to worship this morning. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let's stand together and lift up a shout of praise and of worship and of love and of awe to a good Savior. <laughs> i 
one more time. Praise the Lord. Go ahead and take a quick seat this morning. That is the song of the redeemed. That's the song that we see in, in Psalm 107. I was a prisoner. I was broken. I needed help. I called upon the name of the Lord and I was saved. I just want us to dwell on that psalm for a second this morning. Give you a chance to think about your own story your own testimony, if you are a child of God, if you are saved, if you've put your faith in Christ, then you have a story, you have a testimony of salvation. You know, it's funny, we're talking about this in our, in our men's Bible study, we're given a chance to share, just take, your, take two, three minutes to share your testimony of what your life was like before Christ, when you realized your need and you accepted him as savior, you, you repented of your sins, you trusted what he did on the cross to cover your sins, and then speaking to how he's changed your life. We should see change in our life when we give our lives to the Lord. Amen? We should see that change as he works on us and we, and we seek him. But that's the call of Psalm 107. It says, give thanks to the Lord. He's good. His love endures forever. Even though our faith falls short, his love never falls short. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west and north and south. Of course, we know that's the story of Israel as they fell short. They were scattered. They were punished. They were all over the place, and the Lord brought them back. He's a God who brings us back. And so just take some time in your own heart this morning and pray to the Lord. Remind yourself of the way that he pulls you out of the pit. Remind yourself of the way that he stopped you in your tracks and your brokenness and you gave yourself to him. And as you do that, ask him to grow you in your awe of the gospel. Ask him to grow you in your thankfulness and your gratitude for what he's done. And we're gonna continue singing in a minute from that place of awe and that place of thanks.
freedom I'm living in. But you are my deliverer. You are my promised land. Sing, you are my deliverer. The freedom I'm living in. Oh, you are my deliverer. You are my promised land. Oh, you are my Father God, we come before you and we proclaim your goodness. We proclaim your love. You've revealed your love to us. We can know that you have a love for us, God, because you laid down your life at the cross. May we be people who get excited about that truth, God, because we know that there was nothing in us, no goodness to be found that would put us in right relationship with you, but you and you alone made a way to help us deal with our sin problem, God, to help us deal with having our backs turned to you. You turned us, you wiped us off, you opened our eyes, you drew us near, and we have placed our faith and our belief in you, God. We thank you for all you have done. We pray, God, as we continue to give ourselves to you, we offer our hearts and our minds to you. Let there be no nook and cranny of our lives that we hold to ourselves. God, may we be people who open it all to you. And may you do your cleansing work. May you do your saving work in our lives. We love you, God, and all God's people said. Amen. 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 Go ahead and take a seat as we watch this video. working here in this community here in Swannanoa, we're taking water out of the river down here um, and we take it through a reverse osmosis and uh, we take these all over the world but when this thing's running we fill up this bladder right here this is all clean water it's under pressure and then people come up here and get fresh water the people here are very thankful that we're helping i'm so grateful it's amazing just in two days what they do and accomplish. This is all about faith. It's everything, you know, you couldn't um, ask for anything more. It's a miracle. The volunteers are thankful that they have an outlet for them to be able to serve. By coming up here, you're being the hands and feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I just want to say thank you uh, to everybody that's come and that's volunteered, that's helping us to respond in Jesus' name. Good morning. Good morning. My name's Rodney Thuma, and uh, I'd like to speak for just a few minutes here about Samaritan's Purse Disaster Relief. As you know, in September, a number of southern states were hit with hurricanes that caused flooding and resulted in devastating damages and deaths. What you may not know is homeowners insurance policies do not cover flood. You have to have a flood insurance policy. And because of these damages being in rural mountainous areas, over 93% of those affected did not have flood insurance. 
What's the, what this means is not only they do not get rebuilding help from an insurance company, but they don't even get initial cleanup cost. That leads us into Samaritan's Purse, and I feel like I'm really yelling here. <clears throat> Thank you. So, Samaritan's Purse is one of the first relief organizations to show up and help or offer help to these homeowners devastated by these storms. I've been fortunate enough to work with Samaritan's Purse in the past, and I will be joining them again with a small team next week going down to Boone, North Carolina. Our team will be assisting with debris cleanup, roof tarping, and mud removal. But primarily, our team will be offering hope to individuals who have suffered significant trauma with the loss of possessions, homes, and sometimes family members. We will be setting an example of how Jesus uses ordinary people to be his hands, feet, and hearts of compassion. The team will be serving as day volunteers, which means that we are responsible for the cost of our own lodging, meals, and transportation. The church has generously allowed us the use of the van and has offered financial assistance for the team members that can't go without the financial assistance. We will be, talking, we will be giving you the opportunity to join with us, but whatever funds are given, are not only for the trip next week, but our great hope of future trips in November and the first part of the year. So when you're thinking about that of the small group of this time four of us going, remember we'll be sending other people at a later time. <clears throat> um, you can help uh, financially by going to our giving page and donating to the Hurricane Relief Teams Fund or if you're prepared to donate today, there are offering plates in the back that you can put cash or checks in. Another amazing thing about this church is the Wrapped in Love Quilters have also partnered with us by providing birthing blankets, children's baby clothes, bibs, and 40 handmade quilts to take down with us. I mean, that, that is a, there you go. I mean, what a wonderful example of this church using its gifts and talents to minister in Jesus' name. Early next Sunday morning, we'll be leaving and we'll return late on the 10th. Our greatest need is for one more female and one more male volunteer to join us. If you do that, that helps us to take the lodging cost and cut it in half. As you can imagine, lodging costs in that area, trying to get in is one thing, but the cost has definitely gone up a bit. So any help you could provide financially will go towards that to those team members that couldn't go otherwise. If the dates don't work for you, other individuals are planning to go later in November and at other times. Next week's trip is not meant to be a one and done. We are really hoping that it's just the first of many short-term mission trips. So please consider joining us for an experience that will provide you with an overwhelming accomplishment and a feeling of thanksgiving, and we'll get you one of these cool shirts. <laughs> um, please contact me if you have any questions regarding this or future go, -to, go Team opportunities. And your best chance to speak with me today is down in the anchor room as we pack up the quilts. Thank you so much. you and your servant heart and all of those who are headed off. Uh, great opportunity for us to, to be good senders as well as goers and uh, that fund will be open um, for at least a number of weeks. Pray and seek the Lord, will you? And ask uh, what he wills for you to do. Boy, a few other things uh, that we want to bring to your attention right before we dig in to Luke 15 uh, and they all land on successive weekends. First of all, this week uh, very shortly, the MDO, a Mother's Day Out program, uh, they have a coffee fundraiser, and they are going to be uh, distributing to those at the doors uh, when you leave, just the opportunity for you to understand what that's about, perhaps a good gift that you could give someone else as you look toward the holidays. 
and that does allow them to cover some extra costs as uh, the team is, is definitely committed. Uh, they serve wholeheartedly, doing a great work, but uh, doing their best not to lean on the rest of the church budget. And so this is an opportunity for you to, to help fund that as well. Next uh, weekend, November 2nd, Surviving the Holidays uh, Grief Share Seminar is here at 10 a.m. It'll be downstairs through the office entrance and uh, very important time um, to look forward to some of the ups and downs and the unexpected things at the holidays and uh, to come up with some strategies. So just a wonderful and, uh, and beneficial program. You'll be thinking about that for next week. The following weekend, 9 a.m. is the work day here at church. And so I know it seems like we're asking you to give, 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 but uh, when we have the love of God, uh, we pray that that overflows. And so, so many things to do around the property, beautiful property that God's given us, but it is like having a huge second home for a lot of us. And so if we all pitch in just a little, then we divide some of that labor. So pray about that, will you? See what the Lord would have you do that direction. Okay, with that, we're going to pause and pray for this team. Because as I understand, you guys are already be gone uh, by the time we meet again next Sunday. And so um, even though I'm the one privileged to be up, lifting my voice, and the missions team has been seeking God for years, and these hearts are sold out for showing others the love of Christ, let's join our faith before the one who changes lives. Father, we come to you thanking you that you are a great God, that you are a good Father, and God, that your ways are not our ways. We would never, most of us, imagine you answering prayers for those that we love through such tragedy and loss and show up how the world promises a lot, but it can't deliver security and is not a saving love that the world offers. And so I just thank you, Father, for this team. Thank you for these hearts, God, that are laying down their time and their, their effort and their gifts. And they just want to look someone else in the eye, Father, and show them your love. So we ask you, God, as they prepare that you would shield them in their mind and their life from anxiety and worry and so many things need to come together. We pray that you'd supply for them, Lord, through us but beyond us as well. We ask that the gospel of grace, the good news that God is on the throne and that he welcomes every broken heart, we pray that someone would receive that, Lord, either in a greater way than they have or for the first time. And we're looking to you. Would you um, give them safe travels? Would you empower them? God, would you be glorified in this trip? And uh, we just ask again, that you would burden all of us, not just to say, oh, that's a good thing, or that's a good idea, or to applaud others, but you would help us to say with Isaiah, you are a holy God, your plans are above ours, and so here am I, God, send me. Would you send this church and send our hearts again to those that you love? We pray all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, fantastic. We're going to be in Luke 15. As you can see in your insert, it's going to be helpful for you to have that this morning. As we um, come down to the last two weeks here of the questions of Christ and the way that his questions can open us sometimes, and sometimes it's, uh, they just shock us into reality, but sometimes they pull the lid off of things that we don't want to see and um, sometimes struggle to see otherwise. We're going to shift today from a gut-level ache. Remember that last week, that word splagma, right? That word shows up again in this passage. That, that gut-level compassion, that hurt that the Good Samaritan felt for someone else, shows up today again in the passage about the, the love of God for the needs of our lives, for the lack and the gaps and the things that we can't do. 
And so I've been praying this week that you would understand God has a seeking love. In fact, he has a chasing love. He has a passionate and emotional and joyful and affectionate, maybe is the word, love. And he will carry you with his love. But love and walking in love like that is not automatic every day. And so we are looking at a passage where that was the problem, right? That was the exact boundary and barrier um, with the, the religious people, the church people. They had some struggle in this passage. And uh, Jesus was doing his very best to waken them up to his goodness. And so let's read a little bit in uh, Luke 15. We're just going to read the first uh, two of three that make up one parable. So we'll start at verse 1. It says, Now the tax collectors... <clears throat> And sinners were all gathering around to hear him. They wanted to hear something from Christ. But the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus told them this parable, one parable, three parts. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who turns, who repents, than over 99 righteous persons who don't need to repent, or at least don't think they need to repent. Or, part two of one parable, Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors. This should sound, should sound familiar. She calls them together and she says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There's a pastor in Las Vegas, Judd Wilhite, who shares the story of a church member, maybe not unlike the one that we would have trouble loving, that the religious leaders and those who had a good life, good motives, at least they thought so, and a very good gathering when they met together, they would have trouble meeting with someone who was, someone, uh, who was not good in these ways. This guy named Cody Hoff, and before Cody was at Central Christian Church in Las Vegas, he actually uh, was found sleeping in an open field next to the church. At one time, however, Cody was making tons of money. He was a famous Bass Pro fisherman who had even been featured on ESPN. But he couldn't overcome his addiction in the early 2000s to prescription drugs. He began a crack addiction uh, that led him into some other addictions and eventually smoked up $600,000 worth of savings, his house, his Harley, his new boat, he smoked away everything he had. His family ended up homeless. This is a guy who had eaten at fine restaurants and interacted with celebrities, and he just came to bottom out. Felt like there was no options and no love. Now he was homeless. But love all started with the kindness of one church volunteer. Some people from the church's homeless ministry were handing out sandwiches and reaching folks after a, a church service in the park where Cody slept. And they even invited him in for a shower at Central Christian. 
He later said that the last place he wanted to be was at a church, but he hadn't bathed in so long that even the other homeless guys said, you stink, you've got to stay away from us, right? And so he explains what happened, happened next. Quote, I walked into the church, and it was a lady named Michelle, who knew me from the homeless ministry, and she said, good morning, Cody, how are you? And then she looked at me and she said, Cody, you need a hug. And I said, honey, you don't want to touch me. I haven't had a shower in three months. And if Michelle heard me, she didn't seem to care. She walked up, looked me in the eyes, and gave me a big hug and told me that Jesus loved me. In that split second, I was somebody again. She even knew my name. That was the point where I knew that God was alive in this world. Over the next cent- several weeks, Cody's life began to be restored. He came to Christ, gave his life to the love of God. He started leading a Bible study in the park for other homeless people. That was over three years ago. This was an article back in 2008. He uh, was married, serving faithfully in a ho- homeless ministry, now owns a business. From Ashes, he says, God raised me up in his love to use me as an instrument to show others the welcoming love of God. 1 John 4.16 And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Psalm 33, 17 and 18. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all of its strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope are in his unfailing love. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world Everyone that he gave, his only son. Psalm 63, 3 through 4, because your loyal love is better than life itself, my lips will praise you. And then Ephesians 3, 17 through 19, something I rarely hear in a prayer meeting or rarely pray even with those close to me or leaders, but... I've been praying for you all week. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of God's holy ones to know how high and how wide and how long, how deep is the love of Christ. And to know that love that surpasses knowledge And so, to be filled to all of the measure of God's fullness that he has for you, the fullness of God. In spite of daily universal ache for love, songs about love, stories about love, classics about human love and sacrificial love, Romeo and Juliet type love, In spite of all of that, there is, even in the verses that we share, a lot of understanding of love, the same that those at the meal who were critical had understanding, and yet it is just so easy, too easy, not to be integrated, held together by the very love of God, motivated in our relationships, in our serving in our ambitions, in our future, in need when it comes to us, the ability to, to receive and be changed completely by the love of God. It's not automatic. Very few of our days or plans, I think, are fired or fueled by the jet fuel of God's love. Our ways of relating are scarcely warmed, or transformed, as we can see in the passage, by 
the unfailing ways that God interacts. And we seem okay with this partway love because we rarely pray those things that we just heard others pray. On top of that are self-protective habits and self-righteous side as we saw here. There were those who, righteous persons, didn't think they needed to repent. They were self-righteous. Always setting limits for who's in God's love and who's out. Who's worthy and who doesn't have it. Who's really walking and who's not enough like me. And that us versus them and that escape clause that we have in regard to really needing to love, being commanded to love as we've been loved, and excuses and off-ramps. We just don't fuel a Jesus-centered love life. Jesus' question today is intended to turn the table on religious people used to, you know, comfy meetings and man-made metrics of whether our souls are truly healthy, whether they're integrated and motivated by the greater love of God. The lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son, they all illustrate, showcase something highly valued, but then deeply missed. That that is God's heart, not just for people in general, but for every person in their need, including us. Will he not leave the 99 and search for the one? His intent today is to question mark us to find actually what's lost in us about what we grasp of God's love. So, uh, it's a three-in-one parable of what lost people really mean to God. What you really mean to God. How God feels when he thinks about being close to you and having you home. Because those speaking for God in this passage, at least, were missing half of God in a, in a lot of different ways. Okay, so let's just look again, verses 1 and 2, that's really going to form an important part of the framework and why Jesus showed us something about the lack of love, the love gaps, and gave us a new love connection, right? Tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around him to hear. That's a good thing. They had gathered. Their, their hope was to hear something beyond a typical service, a nice outline, which can't change a life. Um, to hear something besides a great speaker, because they had some of those. To hear some hope, not to gather in a, in a cushy, fluffy, sugary church service, but, man, they came because they wanted hope that they weren't finding anywhere else. And they were gathering around him to hear all about this one who spoke with authority in a different way, of a different level of love. But there were other hearts there. The Pharisees and teachers of law, two different groups, Pharisees were about 20 years trained as uh, lawyerly types, right? They often had the privilege of coming from a family that had some stature. Um, they had the combination of being smart and having that sort of nerdy arrogance, of having trust fund money and having that challenge to relate to people, and then of having a lot of rules and laws that they were enforcing as referees for everyone else. Those were Pharisees. Teachers of the law, separate group, but, you know, close-knit with the Pharisees in their rejection of Jesus teaching about love. Uh, these were one that were intended by God to bring the goodness of God and the, the greatness of his love down through the law so that people could see beyond the minutiae to the big relationship that God offered. But they were doing neither of those things. They were actually critical. They were hardened in three ways. And I just want to think about how our hearts can be hard in the middle of the powerful pursuing love of God. We can know the definition. We can describe it. Um, we can depict it in some ways without it changing us and transforming us. And I think there are three ways that that occurs that are worth trying to be honest about as you talk 
uh, over lunch and as you examine yourself this week. The first one, hard hearts feel deeply about others' sins, not about others' value. You know that your heart is hard. You know that you're struggling with, you know, self-righteousness. I'm a little bit better. I've got it more together. I'm comparing myself. I'm looking down the nose. You know you're struggling with that when you just feel this reaction to people, this fixedness inside of you. Um, they missed that these folks had come out, some of the, the very worst, some of the very most hated, some of the very most needy for restoration to God had actually come to hear, not to party. And there was so much, think of the potential in that setting that if you reached this tax collector, they could witness to the Romans, but they could also witness to God's love to all of those who came and had, you know, we're talking hundreds of people that had to come and give them money. I mean, just in terms of sort of business strategy, they were out to lunch. And so the religious pros are staring. They've got all this negative emotion towards somebody else, but they can't see their own need. They're sneering at Jesus for how he related, and they're trying to fix everybody else. All they could see was the history, the rap sheet, of these sinners. Um, we don't know exactly what that comprised. I'm sure there were some, some folks who had had relational breaks, and their homes weren't right. There were probably those who had some sexual history that was known, and even if it was private, that they were scarred and marked by that struggle. There were those who uh, probably had sold out to some degree, not just in a tax collector sense, but you know, maybe they were willing to compromise on ethics in order to build the business or to expand uh, the family legacy. These were not church people who had gathered, right? These were not the clean. These were not the worthy. All that they could see with a hardened heart was their past. But all Jesus was proclaiming was their potential future in him if love would take over. So number one, hearts can harden when we feel this negative reaction. We're looking at others and we got this anger and we got this uh, criticism. That's a sign that your heart is hardening. Number two, hard hearts do more labeling than welcoming. Isn't that what we see? Um, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They, they took people and instead of knowing their name, instead of saying, that person needs a shower, why don't you come to my house? Instead of looking them in the eye and saying, you need a hug, they just labeled them and stuck them in a bucket. Going to hell bucket. You know, not one of us bucket. Uh, probably a fear of infection happening here is that was part of their understanding of where sin came from. They had taken the Old Testament laws about cleansing and not touching uh, certain individuals or outsiders, and they had warped that and generalized it toward anyone who struggled with sin. Well, of course, they went, never would struggle with sin, right? It's a sick view of people and a sick view of sin. This is why, by the way, just by application, sometimes you'll hear me tag on our mission statement that we believe in loving and reaching people of any starting point passionately connecting them to Jesus because there's so much church programming, so much of our availability goes toward those who are already looking like us and they don't need a shower. We need to be out there. We need to be where the need is. So kudos to you who are going and serving in some of those things. People of every starting point were all over Jesus' uh, ministry. But all they had was this sort of labeling, right? Kind of like the Ford versus Chevy. You know, up north we had that going on. I don't know if that's common around here. I think it's mostly Chevy, right? But up there we had Ford versus Chevy, and Ford stands for this, and Chevy is this. And, you know, it's sort of that, obviously there are good cars in both, good trucks in both. I know some of you would argue with that. You can see me afterwards. Send an email. It's drew at fbcshar.org. <laughs> Hard hearts do more labeling. We love to have people in our party on our side that look like us and smell like us and think like us because they were so insecure. They hadn't bathed in the love of God. 
The love of God has so many victories for those who rely on it. So many ropes that tie us down. So many things that hold us back and interrupt our relationships. If only we would pray. Say, God, give me power in some way to get to that next level of opening my heart to your love. And relying on that deeply. They weren't doing that, so their hard hearts were labeling more than welcoming. Thirdly, this is implied in the, in the text but not stated. It's implied by what comes afterward. Jesus tells three parables all about who God is. And he's not like the rule keeper Pharisees that would never run after the one who's in need. He's the opposite of that. He's the pursuer. He's the chaser. He's pass- he feels emotion and affection for people. And so the third way you know you're hard your heart is hard is when you're the opposite of that. When you have a limited and love-starved view of who God is and what he hopes for from people. It's kind of like, you know, stale cereal. For some reason, we're slowing down the cereal consumption and go into my little cereal Lazy Susan and sometimes I get in the backside and underneath my grape nuts, behind something else, I found there's some little cocoa puffs, right? And there's like, oh, those go well with grape nuts, don't they? Can I get an Amen. So you sort of mix, you got the good, and then you got the tasty, and you got the good for you, and you put them together, and then you realize, you start taking it up, it's like they stick to your teeth and you can't get them off because they're so stale, right? Like stale cereal or pictures on the wall of your home that you walk by. Be careful. God can become over-familiar. You know what to say about him. Somebody asks you point blank, you know what to think about him. You know how to define his love. You know the sort of three happy hops to heaven gospel. You're a sinner, God came. You good? Good. We're good. Okay, let's go. But I mean, are you wrecked? Are you fired? Are you integrated? Integrity is a word that your life revolves around one central and core thing, one ethic, one fuel, one thing that bolts everything together so that there's no spots where there's, you've locked a door and you've said, God, don't come in. When you have a limited view of who God is, you're going to miss something about the power of his love. I mean, if you ask them, they say, oh, we believe in God's plan. Yes, God has a plan. Absolutely. God's plan has been amazing. And there's all these laws given, and then you need to do this. You need to cleanse yourself this way. Yes, 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 God's plan. But if, if you said, well, does God pursue us? They would say, what? God's pursuit? Oh, just do what I say. Just do this plan, and you'll be fine. If you ask them, they'd say, oh, we believe in God's redemption. Absolutely, but, I mean, does it look like they have God's affection? No. No. They've missed the affection. Parts of their life, parts of our life, the way we look at people, the way we allow negative emotion to come in and take over, shows that we're not held together by by unfailing love. Here's the hard truth. We can have a lot of good in our life. We can have a lot of good ethics and do a lot of good things. But we can still not be totally integrated or motivated by the love of God. The relentless, pursuing, affectionate, passionate, carrying love of God. And so, because that's true, Jesus tells the three things. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep. He wants you to know how far the love of God will go. They all showcase something highly valued, as I mentioned. The first of them is this lost sheep. What is the outstanding characteristic of a sheep? Not real smart, not the biggest brain ever, right? I would say that the outstanding characteristics of sheep in Scripture are this. Dumb, number one. Know something, forget it. Onto something, do something else, right? 
Um, number two, the vulnerable. They're kind of cute, right? They're kind of snuggly. You name sheep, right? And you can pet sheep, and they're, there's a warmth to them, but they're vulnerable. Number three, they're nibblers, right? And not wanderers exactly like dogs that I've had, but John J. Davis, who is an expert on shepherds and sheep and spent some time with the Bedouins, I spoke once at a seminary I was at and uh, talked about how, you know, in a, in a new pasture and sometimes you get fighting and things like that, but um, you always just have sort of nibbling your way to lostness. Sheep don't set out to say, I think I'm not going to be part of the, I'm going to go over there. They just ignore, they lose track of the voice, they just, <clears throat> that looks good, that looks good, oh, look at that. And they nibble their way to lostness. We've got to be careful as we look at the lost here, because sometimes, I don't know if you've noticed, but if you say to someone, say that you're burdened for someone at work, and they say, well, I'm not really sure about the church. Which church do you go to? I don't know, maybe I'll listen to one first. And you say, well, you need to come because you're lost. Thanks, man. What? What do you mean I'm lost? And what they hear is what? You are not, you don't have it together like we do. You don't, you don't have good direction in your life. You can't make decisions well. You're floundering and aimless. You're lost. But it's very interesting because while some of those things are theologically true, um, in the passage here, lostness is not about that. Lostness is about something that is valued by God, by the chief character, and it's valuable, and he wants it back. It's wanted, it's desired, it's um, valuable from the owner's perspective. Without this love, there's something that's panicky, right? That's the feeling here. This is a, all three of these are like, there's a panic. He leaves in 99, he's going in the open country. If you've ever lost a dog, you've ever lost a pet, you've ever, you know, had this experience, or lost a child at, you know, a major event, I mean, it'll get your heart going. I mean, it's, it's panicky. And while God is never anxious or worried, there is this sense of urgency to have them back that is in the shepherd's heart. So he goes off and he leaves the 99 and he leaves his assets that he's already worked so hard for and he leaves it all. And there's some danger that they could be stolen, number one. There's danger that they could be eaten, number two. But he says, I'm going to love that lost sheep. And he finds it finally. And what happens when he finds it? Joy. If there's one word, it's just like, yes! 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 There it is! That's mine! Blackie, come here, come on, come on. There's that sense of just affection and ownership. He puts it on, and by the way, that's hard. Have you ever walked with a kid for a while all day at like the zoo or something? But by the time you get to the end, you're just like, okay, now get down careful on dad. And the next morning, you've got that neck problem, right? And so you see the sort of, you know, paintings we have of this, and there's the shepherd like this. But he also works to get this shepherd back to safety. I will tell you that in the same way, there's rejoicing in heaven. That's a way to say the Father... And all who love the Father know, know who has his love. And when that love hits home, when that love gets down to bedrock and all the crap's thrown out, when that rock empties the garbage disposal and puts in valuables of a new identity and a new future and new relationships and new attitudes and, man, just a new future, that heaven just says, Yes, that's what you were made for. And I don't know why, but he stacks three of them on each other. The question that he leaves at the, at the end is very interesting. Um, does he not leave the 99 in the open country go after it? In Matthew 18, he says, does he not leave the 99 and go to the one that's wandering? 
Does he not search for the stray? Does the Father not know the vulnerable time in your life? There are so many people around us who have made a decision for Christ or they've asked Jesus into their heart when they're real, real young or they've had a moral grid that came from their understanding of what God wants in church, but they have walked away. And like all of us, really, they had a season of stupid and the fool took over and they don't know this about God. They think, I've ruined my chance, and I could never be if I came at lightning would strike. I hear that all the time. And you can describe God, and you can, you know, sort of give him a John 3.16 verse, but, verse, but just show them what a heart is like when it's filled and fueled and pursued and wrecked by the love of a perfect God. We need you to show them that joy. There's a second stacked lesson here. It's like when you lose your cell phone, right? It's like when you lose your keys. You can't think of anything else. Call my phone. Who took it? Who cleaned last? Where'd it go? I mean, you're accusing everybody but the Pope on that one, right? Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Very interesting, by the way, that he used a woman. Uh, no teachers in his day would use a woman to depict something righteous, much less the heart of God. If you think that Jesus was demeaning on women or reduced women, you don't know your Bible. And you don't know Jesus' heart. The lost coin is about a panicky woman. It's about a woman who should have known where it was, but she lost it. And what does she do? I mean, she turns on the, all the light that she can and she sweeps the whole place. The sense of, is of what? Of thorough, microscopic search. Because silver was pretty valuable. And even if you're missing one, you're missing something. These parables have something in common. Something costly was lost that every thing, every person searched for something valuable. Number two, something was unexpectedly given up to find it, leaving the 99. In her case, um, having time, having to search and be frantic, and there's a sense of weight that comes in the heart. And number three, there's great joy and celebration by all who loved the finder. God has a passionate and pursuing love for every person, this frantic woman shows it. And so what happens? Until she finds it. When she finds it, she called her friends and says, Rejoice with me, I've found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing. Because God knows those that he has made. He knows that he loves you and wants you. Well, then there's a third. Now there's sort of the home run swing. Whereas... It was 101 and 10 and 1. Now it's 2 and 1. And really, for most of this parable, it's 1 and 1. That God's love is not only sacrificial in leaving the 99, it is not only searching and willing to give to know you, but it's personal. It's relational. J.I. Packer says, the entirety of the New Testament can be summed up in this. The fatherhood of God revealed. The father heart of God revealed. In massive, full color, high definition. No place is that more true than here. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, I wish you were dead. He was, he was going to get the inheritance anyway. All he had to do was wait. But as sin always does, it makes, him, makes us impatient. That there's pleasures that he was looking forward to. And the book of Hebrews says, sin gives you pleasures for a season. But it always, it always falls short. It's always going to run out. It's always going to trick you and take you and make you a slave. And that's what happened. He goes to his father and he says, 
give me my share of the estate, and he divided the property between them. It's amazing here, whereas, you know, in the other uh, parables, they're going and searching here, the father actually is staying home. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, and he set off for the distant country. First thing he did is he doubted. There's four, four roads, I think, that lead to this far country. Number one, he doubted that he had enough, that the father in his family was going to make him truly satisfied. He doubts the father's goodness or wisdom or at least timing. Then he started dreaming of what could be better life if he had total freedom. Total freedom is a myth. Total freedom is a myth. Freedom is doing what you're designed to do and being who you're designed to be. Autonomy is being able to do anything you want. Only God has that. He was dreaming of a better life, and then he departed, and then he was destitute. Let's follow it. The younger one set off for the distant country, and there he squandered his wealth. The word for prodigal um, comes in an idea of, of wild living. A prodigal doesn't mean wandering, it means squandering. I don't know if you know that. We have a squandering word here that's used, and by the way, the same idea is used of the father shortly. After he had spent everything in wild living, there was a severe famine. Famine was a sign that God was at work. Famines came because God brought the famine in the Bible. This wasn't a coincidence. God has a season in life where he will get your attention and ready you for his love. And there was a famine in the country and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to a citizen who sent him to to the field to feed pigs. You know, swine were off limits. They were unclean. But not only was he yelling at the swine or whipping the swine or butchering the swine, he was actually feeding them. This is the lowest of the low. This is the slime on the bottom of a slug for a Jew. And that's where he found himself. He longed to fill his stomach even with the pods. Sin will take you, it will become a master. It will put you in spots that are dark. Maybe it's already put you there. But there's a way out. And you'll see it as he sees it. He, he became so hungry, he actually longed for what the pigs were eating, which would have hurt his stomach probably, but it's a harsh, harsh master. He should have been nauseated even being with the pigs, but he was so hungry He wanted breakthrough. When he came to his senses, praise God, this is a great verse, when he came to his senses, when he had an aha moment that maybe there's a way back to my dad's, even some part of my dad's love, I'll just go and be a slave. And he begins to rehearse this speech. He begins to think, if I go back, I can just tell him, I'm not worthy of you. I I haven't done what's right. I'm not worthy to be called your son. He realized that he was living like a slave, even though he was a son. And what he said, in his mind at least, is, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And he had to dare to believe that his his earthly dad still wanted him. And so he got up, and boy, is that a long way home, isn't it? When you walk that road, and you've been a wanderer and a waster, And you're not only carrying the shame of having told your dad you wish he was dead. You wish he wasn't there. You just want to do it your way. You're a rebel. You have all of that and you have the guilt and the shame of the destructive life that you've built for yourself. And that's a long, hard road. It can feel that way back. But you know what makes it shorter? Somebody's watching. Somebody's waiting while he was still a long way off. His father saw him. He, first, he was on the porch. He so wanted the love of that dad, the love that pictures the father's love, was so eager and waiting that as soon as the son turned around, okay, here I am. Come home. Just come home. 
The father saw him a long way off and was filled, filled with what? That gut word. He was filled with that same love that motivated. It's not just a, well, I guess Jesus died on the cross, so I have to forgive you kind of love. It's not a, well, I erase the whiteboard of your sin, but don't expect, I'm your dad, I'm watching you. Men didn't run in the day of Christ. It was thought of as indignant. Kids ran. Um, to run, they would have had to pull up the robes. And to expose the knee was thought of as nakedness. It's hard to believe now, isn't it? <laughs> Just think crazy. But to expose the knee would have, And so this was unusual. This was beyond normal boundaries. This was a dad who was ex so excited picked it up and just ran out there, bear hug. You know, tears. And the guy starts on a speech. The son. Father, I've sinned against heaven. I'm sinning. I'm no longer... Wait! Don't, don't. Yeah, you're mine. I made you. You're in my image. I, I bought you with a price. You're mine. The father said, quick, bring the best robe. Who would that belong to? Him. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. What's that? Identity. The ring had the signet of the family identity. Put sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf. Bring the very best thing because we're going to have a party. Kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine. Still a son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate <clears throat> Interesting, in Buddhist literature, they, there's a similar thing, but um, you know what they make the son do? He has to work off his debt. Yep. Because nobody has love like this, guys. The father was waiting. That's the last thing he needed to know, that the father's unfailing love was so much deeper, so much better. It's not, by the way, just for those outside the camp. I remember entire seasons serving God hard, serving, you know, trying to be a good dad, uh, trying to serve in a way that others wouldn't, trying to get better grades so I could do more, so I could earn more, so I could give more, so God would love me more. Never thought of it that way, but when you're on that performance treadmill there are a lot of Christian women trying to be good girls. Trying, trying, performance, do this, don't do that, look like that. It's exhausting, isn't it? There's a lot of men who want to be good men. It's just, I'm going to do that, I'm going to, I've got to stop that, I've got to quit that, got to use better language there, i got to be. Those things are good things, but they're a result of being filled by God's love. By the way, if you need a great book, a great devotional, a great drink, a deep drink of the love of God, Dana Ortland. Dana Ortland, really any of his books. Gentle and Lowly, great book, transforming. The father was not waiting with a whip but a hug. Arms that would embrace and not chastise. How far will God's love go? How far did God's love go? Worship team, you can come. Jesus' love. Displayed for you while you were still sinners. While you were far from God, where you were in the ugly slave condition. Well, sometimes now, maybe you even run back to the far country and it's, it's dark and it's shameful. God has pursuing, passionate, personal love for you. And Father, as we admit before you we don't know and receive 
how much we are valued by you. God, we have been too content with a half-filled heart. We're not relying on your love. God, we're not praying for power to grasp how deep and wide, how good and how thorough, how integrating and motivating is the love of God in Christ. I pray for the person who's felt for a long time like they're, they're beyond the saving and satisfying ways of your love. Pray that they would look to you right now. By faith, see the cross of Christ. God's, God's Son, loving, giving, purchasing you back. Father wants you. The Father welcomes you. Would you receive that love? Believer, would you receive that love again? And learn to live deeply in it. Father, would you stir us to receive that love even as we're singing? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand when you feel led to sing. What love could remember? No wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more.
this morning. We, we want to have, as Paul prayed for, as Pastor Pete prayed for, an understanding, a knowledge of the depth and the width and the breadth of it, Lord, that you have for us. May you grow us and challenge us and compel us this week as we ponder that, as we apply that, as we work towards having right understanding so that we might worship you well, worship you as you deserve, as we may obey you as you call us to do, God. May we do it from a heart of love, starting with what you have for us and going out to what we have for one another. Help us in that this week, God. Thank you for your word and for your church family. All God's people said, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being here. Have a great week. If you'd love to connect or pray this morning, we'd love to meet you down front.